Hi everyone, it's Eve Etley Blogs from SparkGirl.com and welcome to the Spark Girl Talk Show podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today and with our very special guest, Sheila Darcy, who is the author of Sketch by Sketch, The Creative Path to Emotional Healing and Transformation. She is also the founder of Sketch Poetic and an advocate for mental health. Her purpose is to elevate art as a tool for transformation and healing. We're going to be talking to her today about the mental health benefits of sketching and how it can play an important part in our overall health and well-being and to help us to feel good from within. Sheila Darcy, welcome to the podcast show. How are you today? I am excited. I'm so happy to be here and I love talking to another Aussie because I used to live there and I'm just happy to connect. And it's so funny hearing you do my intro. It's so far from where I used to be. So thank you for having me as your guest today. Well, your name is a very iconic <laughs> Aussie name, Sheila. Love that. <laughs> Tell us, where did you live in Brisbane? Yeah, it was in Bean Lee. I immigrated to Australia when I was about four, uh, going on five. And then I moved to America when I was 15. So it was a pretty significant time in my life, you know, grade school and a little bit of high school. And a lot of the stories I tell in the book is based on my time in Australia, interestingly enough. And what brought your family to Australia? My mom married my Australian father, who I talk about in the book. He was a, a boxer, but also unfortunately an alcoholic and came from a domestic violence household. And so part of my story of my healing is living through that type of experience, along with bullying. You and I talked prior to this, and I experienced some bullying in Australia when I was younger because there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiments at the time. And so I don't think I realized the effect of it in the deepest sense of how it changed my life until I was older, until I was an adult, because I pushed it all down for like 20 plus years. I pushed all those emotions down. And I didn't know what was happening. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive into your book? So it's interesting, as you were talking about me as my intro, sometimes I have an out-of-body experience because my background is a businesswoman. I've been a business consultant and in the tech space for over 20 years. And so that's my background. So I was a strategist, a marketing person, brand advocate. And so about six years ago, I was an entrepreneur for about five years, and I hit every wall you can as an entrepreneur in terms of growing the business. And I was also traveling a lot for work, and I was experiencing a tremendous amount of fear of flying, specifically turbulence. And it was actually my fear of flying that started off this domino of wanting to address that anxiety. And I had, it was so bad. I used to have to drink before I got on the plane. I drank the entire flight, and I sometimes would be passed out because I was so afraid to fly. And that's a, at the core of a lot of my fears was turbulence. And it ended up becoming a more of a metaphor and it wasn't just a fear of flying. So then you discovered by sketching that would help to ease your anxiety versus using alcohol to take the edge off the anxiety. There's a middle part that's important before I got there. So I finally addressed my fear of flying by going to see a therapist. And I don't know if you're the same way, but I had a lot of stigma around mental health. My upbringing, we never talked about our emotions in that way. You know, therapy was for other people. You know, it's not for people like us. And so I didn't even ever want to see a therapist. But when I did see her, her name was Linda. She explained anxiety to me in a way nobody had explained it before. And she explained it like this. She said, anxiety is energy in your body. You're not releasing. And that energy is caused by emotions you're not expressing. And it's such a beautiful, simple definition in terms of how it's showing up in your body. Then she asked me a simple question. She said, is there a healthy way for you to express your emotions? And I remembered as a kid, I used to draw all the time. But I used to draw to escape my life, like to just check out and disconnect. And I thought, you know, I haven't drawn to connect with myself since I was a kid. And so I said to her, you know, what? I'm going to try it. And so a few months later, I decided I quit this job that I was in that was super stressful and I ended up committing to daily sketching and started a new job. And that's how it all started. It was very innocent and very pure. I did not expect to transform my life the way it did. Wow. So you completely yeah. changed a career out of your fear of flying. And then obviously, like you said, suppressing emotions and, and the therapist really helped open up a pathway 
to dissipating the anxiety. Do you fly now? And you're okay. I do. And I'm so glad you asked. The last three times I've flown during the COVID, of course, so it was very spaced out. I not only did not drink, but I sketched my way through it. And was I still anxious? Of course. But I didn't get drunk. That was huge for me. <laughs> and secondly, even the times that it was turbulent, I wasn't as, like you said, fight or flight. You know, I wasn't like grabbing onto things and trying to hold up the plane with my hands. <laughs> so yeah, I was much more aware. All I'm doing is bringing an unconscious to the conscious field. So I think just knowing that I was afraid, but it wasn't about the flying. What I realized is my fear was really stemming back to my childhood and a lot of fears of not being safe and connecting that. They say a lot of times it is going back to your childhood and figuring out as an adult what's triggering so many things. You mentioned when you spent time in Australia that you experienced some racism or some unkind people. How did that come across? Was it just the way that people said things about you personally or just about the race in general? Yeah, it was mostly race. And listen, it's interesting. That was what, 30 years ago that I was experiencing that, or m maybe even more than 30 years ago. But the reality is not much has changed. The tolerance level has shifted a little bit. But yeah, no, it was mostly around the color of my skin, the shape of my eyes, my nose. And so I was very externally focused because that's what was being reflected back at me from society is this is all that mattered, right? The physical, how I showed up. So that's why I became a people pleaser and a perfectionist because I thought if you liked me and if I was perfect, you would never hurt me. That was a construct in my head. And as a kid, it seemed so simple, but the reality is that's not how it works. Life is uncertain, suffering does exist. And so that safety that I was looking for externally, I realized the safety I was really looking for was within and sketching daily and really using art as a way to connect back to my inner self was the only way I was able to find that inner peace again. And so, yeah, I think that was the big thing. I, nobody had ever told me that art could heal. I always thought art had to be this masterpiece. So you had to be a full-time artist and make a living at it. Nobody told me that art could heal, like in the way that it's healed me or healing me, should I say. Part of the reason I feel my book matters or the work that I'm doing matters is I speak from one place and one place alone, and that's emotions and feelings. Emotions and feelings don't care about your gender. They don't care about your race. They don't care about your socioeconomic background because emotions are universal. So that's one thing. Second, I'm a very compassionate person. I was raised very compassionate. So when I tell you my stories, I don't have a lot of judgment or certainly a lot of hate towards anybody that hurt me. I have a lot of compassion for it. What I do see now is fear. It's very clear to me that a lot of the behaviors that are see that are unhealthy, I often say is if you don't express yourself in a healthy way, it comes out sideways, right? And that could be bullying, violence, it could be micro actions as well. It's not always the big things we see in the media. But if you can come from a place where we're connecting on an emotional level, you realize how similar we are. Because the deeper the pain, the more universal it is. All of us have a universal fear of not being loved. We all have a universal fear of not belonging. I have yet to meet one person that didn't have that fear. It may show up different ways, but it's there. And so what my book does is it's inviting you to get in touch with your own emotions, your own feelings. Stop listening to what the media is telling you, society is telling you. What do you think? How do you feel? And own it. And even if what you feel isn't in alignment with everyone else's, I think questioning and understanding and being curious about your own beliefs is what is going to help us heal the world because we haven't really reflected as much inward as we should. And when it comes to sketching, some people feel that they're not creative. What would you say to that person who's tuning in? That's the number one statement I get. Either I am an artist and I don't want you to judge it, or I'm not an artist, more, more so that way. What I'm asking you to do or inviting you to do is to feel your body. So when I think of sketching, I don't think of it as the wrist down. I think of it as an embodied practice. So I'm paying attention to the aches and pains in my body because there's a book called How the Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And he talks about if you've ever experienced challenging situations or trauma, we store it in our bodies. And I didn't know that. You know, I had a really successful trajectory and career. And when I hit this wall that I'm talking about, society would have deemed me successful. So I had a 
great paying job. I was an executive woman. I have a great family, but inside I was completely falling apart. So is that success? No. And so, yeah, going back to the sketching, the reason I find that it's therapeutic and meditative is I actually ask you through the book to not think of it as, as art. Think of it as a way to feel your body and then release it on paper. So the example that I give is like dancing. When you listen to a sad song and I asked you, Yvette, do a sad dance, would you move slow? Would you be big? Would you have big movements or would you have small movements? And that's all you're doing on the paper. So if I'm expressing sadness, I'm not drawing tears. I'm sketching the feeling of sadness. This looks like sadness to me right now. See how my hands are moving? Now, does this look sad? No, it probably looks excited, a little anxious potentially. That's what I'm guiding you to do is to feel it through your pen. And that's the difference between sketch poetic versus drawing. Wow, I'm glad you explained that. You talk about how it's a great tool for negotiating change. So one of the things I ask you to do is use a pen because when we use a pencil, we have an innate desire to undo, edit, erase. Even if you're really good, you're like, I have self-control and I don't want to erase. Most people don't have it. Most people want to erase because they're, they're too busy trying to make it perfect. Using a pen, every time you make a mark, you can't undo it that piece of paper has forever been changed. So imagine that as a metaphor for life. Every action, every word, everything that's ever happened to you, you can never undo, right? And so one of the reasons it's so transformative, and this is why it transformed my life, is I was so unconscious of a lot of things in my life. Things were happening to me, but I didn't notice because I was so busy being a businesswoman. I was so busy trying to hit the next goal, you know, being a great wife, a great mother. And so I was so goal oriented. So change was happening constantly, but I wasn't conscious of those things because I was only focused on one thing. What the sketch poetic is doing is just asking you to sit in the stillness of the creating process and everyone's a creator. Let me just reframe what creativity is. Creativity is three things to me. And this is my belief. It's play. It's curiosity and it's imagination. Name one person in this world that doesn't activate those three things at any given time. So we're always creating. The problem is, is what I said to you, we stop playing, we stop imagining, and we stop being curious. That's what sketch poetic is. So when you do those three things, you just become more aware of the change. And the good news is there's nothing to do. Awareness is the healing. That is the healing. There's nothing to act on. There's nothing to fix. It's just like, oh, I didn't know I did that, or I didn't know I was doing this, or I didn't know this is how I was reacting. It's just being aware. I love that because you reminded me that, as an example, when we're young and little and kids, we're just so inquisitive. We've got so much curiosity. We're trying to figure everything out. We're playing, having fun, but then we become this adult and then we're taught to suppress our emotions you know don't dance or sing out in the shop people think you're crazy the two things that why that happens is rules and audience we have rules in mind and an audience in mind that's watching us that's what happens and it doesn't do anything for our mental health because I was a bit like well if Beyonce can sing out loud and dance and people think she's cool and she's not crazy why can't I or the woman down the road who's 70 or the young girl who's 21 do the same and because society shows unless you're a celebrity unless you're a, a famous pop star you're the only one who can sing in public and we won't deem you to be crazy so there's these dance mm -hmm. and it really suppresses our emotions and i often think it makes us so depressed <laughs> when we don't express our joy and happiness and i often wonder Imagine if we, everyone in the world, as an example, just loved a song, they heard it in the shop, and they all started singing. Seriously, yeah. imagine that kind of world if we expressed our happiness or joy. The sketch by sketch allows people to do both, but both getting to the core of the healing part and the trauma because so many people have gone through trauma. We all have. The yeah. pandemic is traumatic. And there's not one person that's come out unscathed, in my opinion. Every one of us have been touched by COVID. On your Instagram page, you've got so many beautiful sketches. 
you use different colours. Can someone get colourful pens? Does using colour help to bring out emotions? I'll answer that in a way that helps people understand that this book meets you where you are. So if you are a person that's already comfortable sketching, then yes, introduce color because you're so comfortable with it. However, if this is a whole new practice for you, you've never really considered yourself an artist, the answer is no, start simple. The black and white is a metaphor. There's something about the black and white reflection because one of the things I talk about is you're giving your emotions permission to be seen outside the page. And sometimes adding color or adding too many elements to it can be a bit overwhelming. It's already overwhelming that you're putting it out there. So by making it simple black and white, it's a much more stark, simple thing to engage with. Now the color, I started introducing about a year into the practice because I was getting in a plateau, meaning I was already feeling like I'd plateaued in terms of the sketching tools. So I wanted to experiment more. So one of the things I talk about in the book, if you've been doing this and you're six weeks in, six months in, and you want to introduce a guitar, you want to introduce dance lessons, you want to start cooking lessons, I'm an advocate for all forms of creative expression. I am definitely not possessive about it because nothing I'm doing is original. And I say that in a good way. Like I'm not doing anything that hasn't existed before. All I'm doing is talking about it in a different way, in a way that seems to be connecting because people understand the way I'm I'm doing it for me in terms of a, an expression of my trauma and my pain and my emotions. And I don't think that's been expressed in that way enough for people to actually hear it. And for some reason, the way I'm talking about it is connecting with people. But like I said, this has existed from the dawn of time. Art's always been a healing tool. We just never yeah. talked about it in that way. When you sketch each day, do you do it a set time? I recommend a set time if you can make it happen. COVID really messed all of us up. I was really good at doing it at every single time because I was doing it before work. And then COVID hit and I was working from home. So the answer is if you can make it more ritualized, the better. So whether that's the time of day, whether it's the setting, coming up with a table somewhere or in the garden or somewhere it feels sacred. But the good news is my book says 10 minutes or 30 minutes. And that's all you need. 10 minutes is nothing. Like we scroll through Instagram longer than 10 minutes a day. And so 10 minutes is the shortest commitment I ask of you. And 30 minutes is the time frame I'd like you to work up to. I do it personally for about 45 minutes a day because it just feels right. But I definitely time box it because I had the issue of perfectionism that I was working through. So if I didn't have a time box, I'd still be perfecting it. So I had to work on just walking away from it. When someone's trying to emotionally heal and get the trauma out of their bodies. Does the person need to just sort of sit there in a little bit of a meditative space, meaning a bit of a quieter space with themselves, with their book? How can they tap into how they're feeling within, like their emotions? I said no when you said they had to be quiet. That is the key to why it helped me. So I live in LA and yoga and meditation is huge here. Everyone did yoga and meditation, all my friends did anyway. And I always had a hard time with it because my understanding of it, and I've since understood it's not the correct understanding, but it's how what I saw is that I had to quiet my mind. I had to sit still, which were two things I couldn't do. <laughs> I, was very, I was very frenetic at the time and my mind's always racing. And so you were asking me to go from 150 miles an hour or 150 kilometers an hour to zero and it wasn't possible. So when I started sketching daily, you know, it started like doodles. I actually allowed all those things to happen because I wasn't judging myself for it. And I wasn't trying to push it away. I'm going to say doodle because it's accessible yeah. to everyone. It's deeper than doodling. But as I started doodling and sketching, I started to pay attention to my thoughts. Emotions and memories started to come up. So what would happen is I would get, call it the monkey brain. A thought comes in and you chase it. And then another thought comes in, you chase it, right? So what I did is if my thoughts were jumping, I would sketch that way. I'd be like, oh, I'm jumping across the page. If I'm going down a rabbit hole, I would draw the rabbit hole. Like I basically, what I was doing is sketching through what I was going through. That's my mantra, sketch through what you go through. And so if my knees were tapping, I would tap my pen. So I was in essence using my pen as a way to mirror what was happening and I wasn't trying to quiet my mind. But the irony of all ironies is it allowed me to become more regulated, calmer, and I was able to meditate eventually.
started as frenetic and hyper and yeah, that's what's yeah. beautiful about it. Do you like to sit down when you're being creative? I do. Although one of my prompts that I introduce is standing up and creating because it gives you a, a sensation. So all the prompts in my book, there's 40 prompts, is not the traditional prompts you'd get in drawing books. So one of the things I want to make sure it's clear why I call it sketching. In the art world, sketches weren't usually seen. So if you look at masterpieces and if you went to see a, a retrospective of a famous artist, oftentimes people loved seeing the sketches because they were never seen. And I love the metaphor of that, that your sketches aren't meant to be seen. It's like a journal. It's, it's personal. There's no audience. That's the first thing. I didn't have trauma. That's the one I get a lot is I had a great childhood. So I feel bad. I, don't, I feel bad that, you know, and I'm like, no, it, you're actually going through a lot of trials and tribulations right now. Don't compare your experiences with others because what you're doing is, again, discounting, suppressing your feelings for whatever reason. We all do this thing we would compare. I was always comparing myself to other people. In the business world, you're always competing against another person to go up the corporate ladder, right? So society just creates all these systems and structures that pits us against each other. And so why I keep on asking people to go inward is there's no competition there. It's just you and you alone. There's nothing else but you. And that's why it's so scary. I think that's a scarier proposition for people. It feels safer to be in the world than to be inside. I used to think that too. But yeah. when I started using art, it made it feel safe. Now that your book is out, how does it feel for you to actually see your transformational tool that healed you, that transformed the way you felt and your traumas and your life and your anxiety Mm -hmm. out there to the world well I just want to clarify one thing I will never say I'm healed I'm still healing I think my entire life I'll be healing because I still get anxious so I want to make that really clear to people listening I will never say I'm healed what it's done is it's helped me find inner peace in moments when my life is shit <laughs> like when things are scary when the world is scary I'm able to find that pocket of peace through my art but the, do I still feel all those emotions? Absolutely. I just want to clarify that. How does it feel for my book to be out there? It's awe-inspiring. The way I visualize it is the ripples, right? I genuinely believe that this book was divinely guided. And I don't mean that just in the spiritual sense. I do believe this book is greater than me. And what I mean by that is once I created and wrote what was happening to me and how it was transforming my life, I put it out there in the hopes, and this is why I call it a tool. I'm not a proponent of books that say, if you do this, you're going to be fixed. Or if you do this, you're going to be perfect and happy. You're not going to get that from me. What I am telling you is this is a tool, sketching, dancing, music, all of it. If you allow yourself to use it in the way that I used it to help me through the process, then you might find your way home to yourself again. And so it's just awe-inspiring. The best feeling I can ever get is when somebody tells me, hey, Sheila, I see what you, what you saw in it. It's the most beautiful reflection, and that's ultimately my definition of success. If it helps one person out there find their way back home to themselves, man, it's the best feeling ever. Wow. That is so empowering and so powerful, your words. And just to think even when you get the response from one person knowing that you've transformed their life or help them with this tool because you're right, life is going to go pear-shaped time and time again. And I really love your honesty about, hey, I'm not healed. No. And here's the beauty of healing. When you think you're done, something else happens in your life and it says, no, you're not. You're not done with that. And that's the beauty of the tool. So I continue to sketch through it because the world tells me healing is always ongoing. That's what we're supposed to be. We're human. We're fallible. So that's the goal is to constantly evolve and work through it. And do you think, Sheila, with your sketch by sketch, if someone's feeling like they don't fit in and they feel they're not enough, feel that that sketch by sketch could just build that inner self-love again and that inner connection? I can only speak for myself. Mm. That sense of belonging that I've always aspired to be. I remember as a kid, I used to wear the clothes pen because I wanted my nose to be pointy. I wanted to be light skinned because I wanted to look like everyone else. And then in my 20s and 30s, I worked for strong company cultures 
And I wanted to be the executive woman that I thought everyone wanted me to be. But here's the interesting thing that happened. And this is where I hope it leads you as you're listening. The point about us belonging is because we see something outside of ourselves we think we want to be. But we often don't ask ourselves, do we want to be the thing that we're looking at? And I started asking myself that. Like, do I really want to be that executive businesswoman that looks like this? Not really. Do I really want to be light-skinned and look like everyone else? Not really. And so what ended up happening as I started to find that inner love that you said, the beautiful thing happened is that I now feel more comfortable walking on my own path and not feeling so scared. Because the thing is, when we belong, the core of it is safety. It's not actually about belonging. It's the feeling of safety. It's human innate in us. I mean, if you look at the cavemen and indigenous cultures, right? You see it in Greek mythology. One of the ways they would ban you from your, the village, that to them was death. Like the moment you don't belong to a tribe, that was death to them. And so that mentality is what we're innately born to think that I must belong to a tribe, otherwise I'm not going to belong to anything. And so understanding that that's at the core of who we are. But the good news is now, as we walk the path of inward, we start to embrace who we are. We start to realize we can have our own path. There's room for all of us. And that's the key. It's what you said. Self-compassion and self-love is the healing as well. There's so much to healing. But the good thing is, as we're walking side by side, like I told you this when you and I spoke, I said, we're walking the same path. We're just doing it together side by side. And then the more of us walk together in the same direction, the community builds that way. And that's our sense of belonging. That is so beautiful. So it's so important to belong to yourself first. Yes, that's it. There you go. You just surmised it. <laughs> when I listen to your words of wisdom then, because we're trying to belong to everything outside of us. But if we just start to belong to our own self first, then we get that sense of security and safety and I'm okay. Like yeah. We build it from within first because yes. if seeking it outside of us, we might not ever find it outside of us. Someone's not going to say, hey, babe, you belong, <laughs> you're safe. But I love your philosophy and I love what you're doing. I want to ask you, you've got your right brain to help unlock your basic human needs. You've got your left brain. We heard this kind of growing up in high school, oh, you're only using your left brain. You need to use your right brain or you're using your right brain and you need to use your left brain. But no one ever explained this. What does all this left brain, right brain thing mean in creativity or art? Well, this is again, the good news is when you start with the feelings and the emotions, you're activating both. But to answer your question, the left brain is more the rational side, the logical side, and the right brain is supposed to be our imagination, our playful, creative side. Why I say the good news is it doesn't matter if you're a, a systems engineer, an accountant, that's always in the numbers. You can activate your creativity through, again, the three things I said, play, imagination, curiosity, which we all do. But going back to the emotional part of it, there's three parts to emotions that are important that people may not be aware of. There's the feeling of it, which we've talked a lot about. There's also the expressing of it. And so one of the things we do is we judge emotions, right? Anger is bad. Sad is bad. Joy is good. Hope is good. But the reason we do that, unbeknownst to us, is how we see it expressed. I put anger in a bad category because I only saw it expressed in violence or bullying. Mm. If I saw anger expressed in a beautiful painting, in a song, in a dance, would I feel that way? Probably not. It's just that I only saw negative expressions of it. So why I invite people to use art is you can express all of those emotions and they're all the same. They're actually all on the same level playing field. And the third part of emotions, again, feeling, expressing, is finding meaning in it. And when you find meaning in it, you are activating your left side of your brain because it's the contemplation, the asking questions, the ruminating. So why I love this practice, I'm very strong on the left side and the right side. And you might be strong all on the left, or you might be strong all on the right, but Sketch Poetic is inviting you to use both to find meaning in the emotions that you're experiencing. Wow, that's incredible. With so many people wanting to get so much off their chest, literally like <laughs> off their chest, <laughs> off you know their that, yeah. 
We know that generally if you do that, say, on a platform like Facebook, the chances are if you get it off your chest there, you're going to be attacked by people who knows what. Yep. What I love about this sketch by sketch and what you're teaching us is that we can get out our emotions and how we're feeling in a safe environment and we're not putting ourselves at harm. We're not going to go on a platform where we, it's out of our control. Yes. What we think might be right or wrong, but regardless, you're putting yourself out in a position where you can get attacked. I really like your approach to the pandemic now, how we can use the sketch by sketch and really just get our thoughts, feelings, emotions out, but in a safe way. Yeah. Page becomes a container. And I actually built a platform for my community that your readers and your audience should know about. It's called emotionplatform.com. It's an easy thing to remember. If you go to emotionplatform.com and you have to get a login because I wanted to make it a safe space for my community, you upload your sketch you tag at the emotions you were feeling and then the person can come in. I'm sad today. And I search for the word sad and every sketch from around the world that was tagged sad will come up wow. and that's the platform. And it's only for people that have been part of the sketch poetic community. But I'm saying that because what you just said, and the great thing about sketches is remember I said, when I asked you to express anger, you're not sketching a knife or sketching a gun. You're sketching the feeling of anger. So it might be fast and furious or it could be big. What's really interesting about it is when somebody looks at it, they may feel very different of what they see. Like I might look at it and go, oh, were you feeling excited? And I'm like, no, I was expressing anger. That's really interesting that you should say that. So it doesn't matter what you see. It's what I felt and what I'm expressing. So that's the other beautiful thing is when you engage people in your sketches, you're not trying to get them to critique it or trying to get them to see what you see. You're engaging in a beautiful dialogue that says, if that, that's so interesting that you saw excitement, I was expressing anger and here's why. Wow. You know, and it, that's the dialogue. And this is what it came up for me. Oh, that's so interesting. That didn't come up for me. And so we're talking about emotions, but in a very safe way because it's art. Beautiful. And you know what's interesting? When you talk about sketch, for our listeners, doodling is another word you've used to help. We're just talking about sort of doodling like a little kid kind of thing and it can yeah. be any which way. It can be up, down, circles, around. Yeah, I call it abstract. Yeah, abstract art. I love your safe space that you've created there. I want to ask you, you obviously help so many people with healing, sketching, emotions. How do you actually look after your own self and what are some of your self-care rituals? It's the question I ask myself all the time because I sketch daily. That's a given. A lot of my prompts that I have in my book have to do with breath because I was a shallow breather my entire life. I held my breath a lot and I didn't even know I held my breath. That's how unconscious it was. Like I would be out of breath and I didn't know why I was out of breath. It's because I held my breath a lot whenever I felt threatened or scared, but I didn't know it. Breathing, sometimes just breathing is a great daily practice. Uh, and staying hydrated. The other thing I like to do is walk. I'm huge into being in around nature. And I think that pandemic and COVID really, I hope it helped us appreciate nature more because what it forced us to do is when we were forced to be home and be inside. Do you remember the first time you went out again? It felt different, right? You looked at the world differently. And it's because nature wants to be seen. We want to connect with nature. I would say just walking out and just actually truly like looking around and being present is my biggest daily ritual. And that's why when I answer this question, you don't hear me say spa treatments. Those are all wonderful. The thing is, it's a Band-Aid. Like mm -hmm. if I get a massage, I feel good, but then, then what? Like what else do I have to do? These are things that we can do every day. I love that approach, the holistic approach. I'm the same. Like I love the spa treatment. I love the massage. I do too. It's amazing. Oh, and I wish we could all have it every day. But realistically, we can't. If I can afford a massage every day, I do it. Exactly. It's a treat for all of us. And when the spas were closed, sadly, due to the pandemic, we really had to figure out self-care every day. And I love how you've switched, say, drinking alcohol to deal with your anxiety of flying. And I'm sure there's actually a lot of listeners now tuning in globally who have a fear of flying. So you've just given them a really good tip on this sketch by sketch so they can get a copy of your book because they can go from 
any type of anxiety, because it's quite clear that a lot of people who have anxiety, we do tend to have a drink and we know the doctors even tell you, you can have a drink and it takes your edge off your anxiety. Just one yeah. drink. And then what happens is you have another drink and another <laughs> drink because it's highly addictive yeah. and another drink. So I guess anyone who's going through a situation where they're using alcohol to deal with the anxiety, which might, by the way, I think our sales in Australia went up yeah. during the pandemic. So I feel that anyone's using substances. Sort of substance. There's a term in America, I don't know if they use it in Australia, Netflix and binge. Have you heard of that? Again, no judgment. I'm not a judgmental person. No, no judgment. Sure. Whether it's heroin addiction or Netflix, what you're doing is numbing. You're numbing because you just don't want to feel anything. And that's the disconnect. And so why I'm so compassionate about people that are in pain and suffering at this particular moment, and I want you to hear me if you're listening, whatever you're doing to cope, that's your way of trying to survive mm -hmm. and have compassion for yourself. Now is the time though, to find healthy ways to deal with it. Because in the past, that is the way you've survived. And that's why I say that I do have a lot of compassion for people because and like, you know, you talked about the indigenous cultures in America. I'm sure it's similar to the Aborigine culture, but in the indigenous cultures here in, in the U.S., alcoholism and meth addiction and a lot of addiction is high. And you get this, is that one of the ways cultures get past is through storytelling, right? We tell stories. Well, what if you're so drunk and so out of it? A, you remember the story, but B, you don't even pass it down anymore. And that's how our cultures are dying. Part of it, not the only reason, obviously, there's violence as well, but I don't want to underscore the power of creativity because storytelling is another form of creative expression, right? Poetry, song, it's just how we pass down. And what we don't know is we're killing our culture through addiction and yeah. through numbing our bodies, numbing ourselves. The reason I really wanted to share you on the Spark Girl podcast show, because as soon as I saw this, how you could transform your life, process your emotions and find joy simply through creating a daily sketching practice that shifts from negative thinking and spiraling emotions into the realm of possibility. I'm like, this is going to be a go-to <laughs> mental health tool that we all need to know. I'm getting goosebumps now. I am too. If we could learn about how to process our emotions in a healthy way, this is what really has to get out there. So that's why I really, really, really wanted to share Sketch by Sketch in your work because if we can find tools that can help us in the most healthiest way to deal with stress, anxiety, depression, a feeling worthless, traumatic pain of generations upon generations, imagine how incredible this world's going to be yeah. We have uh, so much potential. I, first of all, I felt hugged by everything you just said. I love hearing it from somebody else because that's how I feel about it. But to hear it reflected back, such a gift. I want to say something in a way that is really important to this conversation as a way to kind of put a wrapper around what we've been talking about. The thing that makes me sad today is when I wrote this book, I started writing it about three and a half, four years ago before the pandemic. Wow. I would say to you, most people had a hard time sitting in the shadows, sitting in the darkness. You know what I'm seeing now is the opposite. We have been sitting in our anxiety and our sadness and our anger and our depression for so long right now. What I'm observing is people are having a hard time sitting in joy and happiness. And that makes me sad. And the reason they're feeling challenged by it is they don't know a how to feel it again this is my observation just because i've done so many workshops and and i'm walking around the world and i'm seeing like people have been sitting in the shadows for a long time lately but i don't think they know how to express it in a healthy way so when we talk about emotions i want to make sure everyone understands it's all spectrum of emotions that people are struggling with i'm seeing more and more children struggle with happiness they don't know the last time they were happy that's really hard to hear as a parent i've heard that from kids. And so I wanted to share that because it's not just sitting in the darkness. People are also struggling to sit in the light right now. And so this tool meets you wherever you're at. And then the last thing I wanted to say, remember I said about the path, walking path alone. I love what you said, belonging to yourself. There's a dirty little secret about that though, that I had to learn. And I say dirty little secret is when you're 
focused on belonging to a tribe or a village or other people, you can also hide behind it because you don't have to be accountable. So the reason a lot of us are scared to walk our own path is there's no place to hide anymore. Now you are fully accountable for every action, every thought, every experience. So while it is a beautiful experience to walk alone and feel that self-love and self-compassion, you have no more places to hide. And I genuinely believe that's why a lot of people opt out is because they've got nowhere to hide. It's easier to blame another. It's easier to blame a company, my parents, my spouse. My, it's easy to blame. This is me talking about my healing journey. I saw myself and I'm like, oh, I was afraid to be alone. I was afraid to walk that path alone because it's easier to hide behind everyone else. <laughs> so understand that that's why I think some people struggle with this path. And, you know, you mentioned about the children. I only noticed that yesterday when mm. I was little, I had the biggest smile. I'm running around the neighborhood, really happy. And I observed this even when I go to coffee shops. Not all, but a fair majority not smiling and saying, how are you? Or mm. acknowledging when they walk past another human being just the acknowledgement of hello, how are you, a smile. I feel that it's very sad, very down, very angry. Yeah. Not wanting to connect human to human energy. Yeah. And it's really sad to see so many young people so depressed. It's depression, absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying to encourage more and more people, whether you pick up a book and read some words, whether you yeah. do the sketch by sketch, but creativity, as you said, the dancing, but doing yeah. these things where you don't have to video yourself. You no. Sketch by sketch. You don't have to sit up and say, hey, everybody, I'm doing sketch <laughs> by sketch today and put your tripod there and film that. And if you're doing your dance in your lounge room, you do not have to video that, but everybody probably would for TikTok. But trying to get back to some normality where we can do something on our own, but it yeah. doesn't have to be broadcasted to the world. It doesn't have to be captured. We don't have to be a reality TV star. Like Amen. Yep. away from the entertainment and just doing the healing and the transforming within without yeah. the audience. Yes, you're an audience of one. I love that we're ending like that. Audience of one, and you're not performing. All of it's performance. What you just described, we're performing. And yeah, we have to stop performing, but we're performing for an audience. Whoever that audience is, yes, for a lot of people, it's social media. But I would say if you were to unpack that, it's just a big metaphor for somebody in our life that we were trying to please. We're trying to find it somewhere. We're trying to find it through social media because we're not getting it from our spouse or our partner or our parents or our friends. And so I often think it, this is a symptom, not the cause. Social media is a symptom. It's not the cause of why we want to find belonging. And I see that even people that are just 100% online all the time, they, they, they have a hard time socializing physically because they don't know how to communicate or have eye contact anymore. <laughs> and so we really have to be careful. My hope for my book is that it bridges us back to your point, the digital to the physical. If you're going to share, let's sketch together in a park. Let's go to a coffee shop together. Let's meet up and let's yeah. sketch together. Like I want that to me would be another big dream. You asked me earlier, my dream for it is we connect as human beings in a true magical way. So really anybody could get a sketch by sketch group club. Yeah. You could hang out with your family or friends or do it at home and then catch up for a coffee or go to the park or go to the beach. Yeah. And then just talk about how you felt within the week and, yeah. and just share and use it as a tool to talk about how you feel. Or a family could do it at their table where they have yes. their kids expressing how are you feeling, what did you sketch, and this creative dialogue. And even if you only found one person, like a sketch by sketch buddy, and use it as therapy if you can't afford totally. therapy. I just love what you've created here and I love Thank how you. you've got 40 sketching prompts on a variety of topics from hope to stillness that will help you connect with your emotions, practice mindfulness and negotiate change. I could speak to you forever, Sheila Darcy. Seriously, okay. this podcast show hasn't been long enough. Sheila Darcy, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a guest on the Spirit Girl podcast show. 
it's really been an honor and I'm super grateful I got to meet you today. I love what you've created. I love it as a tool to help everyone during these very challenging times, but for the rest of our life, it's a tool that can be used for our, our whole journey. And one that once we discover how it transforms the way we feel, we can then share that with others. So it's really about getting this message out there to people. How can we stay in touch with you after this podcast show? Started an Instagram account to hold myself accountable. And that's the only reason I started it. So it's sketch poetic. And then you can also, like I said, emotionplatform.com if you want to start sharing your sketches, but do buy the book. If you, even if it's not for you, maybe it's for somebody you love, that would be another way to do it. But you can also contact me through sketchpoetic.com. We'll stay in touch with you. I'll leave all the links, but I love the idea of a gift also, because I feel that even when I just look at that book, I go, wow, if you're going through cancer. Mm -hmm. whatever it might be it's just a spectrum because emotions they're there with us every day they're not going it's what, anywhere it's what connects us i also wanted to take a moment to reflect back to you which i don't know if you've heard it enough you are a magical person you have this generosity about you that leaps off the the screen but i want you to know just based on the time we've had together a podcast i've listened to your passion and purpose to help us address our mental health and holistic health. There's so many people that need it. So thank you for creating a platform for people like myself to share my story, my tool, but there's so many of us out there. So thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for, for having me as your guest, but for what you're doing. It's uh, so needed. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. I'm truly grateful because I really just, when the pandemic started, I was in lockdown. I came back from the Maldives. And I knew nothing about COVID, but I had mm -hmm. to get a COVID test. I felt so anxious, so overwhelmed. My anxiety was through the roof. And I felt like, wow, if I'm feeling like this, maybe other people are feeling like <laughs> this. And then I didn't know. I've never been in lockdown in my entire life. I didn't know what this was going to be all about. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe if I'm feeling like this, others will feel like this. And I thought, well, how can I help and serve others? Well, obviously doing my travel presenting and travel shows was out the window, but I honestly was like, how can I help and serve others? And mm -hmm. that's when it came to me, oh, you can interview people, find out what they're doing to feel good from within or what they're doing to cope with stress, anxiety, this whole overwhelmment situation and then share their self-care rituals or their stories or what they're doing. Yeah. And then we can learn from each other, as you say, connection, learn yep. from each other. But then I was really passionate about wanting to give tools. Yeah. So I'm so conscious that we have people say in our Aboriginal and remote communities that are 750 Ks from a shop, or we have people on our Aussie outback farms yeah. for nowhere. And we just got people in lockdowns as people all over the world. And I was like, wow, what if you can't afford therapy? Yeah. It, no, that's a big reason why I do what I do. It's accessible. Yeah. And then that's why I'm like all these tools, if you try. They're in front of you. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. So thank you again for your kind words. That truly means the world to me because as you know, there's a lot of work that goes into the podcast show. And as oh, we yeah. know, we were so persistent <laughs> to have this podcast, even though the equipment wasn't working. But Sheila Darcy, we will say officially goodbye to you. Thank you for being a guest on the Spirit Girl podcast show been an honor i want to also thank our global audience right around the world for being part of the spirit girl podcast show i've added in the words feel good from within because that's really the mantra and the purpose and the intent for all of you who are tuning in but to get this message out to a much broader audience i would love if you could share this with everyone you love and know or even a stranger you meet along this road and if you could subscribe, leave a five-star rating and review and to tell someone you'd love to, that would be incredible. And together, let's feel good from within.